Chapter 19. Another summer had come, and still I had not speared the giant devilfish that lived near the cave. Every day during the spring, Rontu and I went to look for him. I would put the canoe in the water and paddle slowly through the cave, from one opening to the other, often several times. I saw many devilfish there where the black water is streaked with light, but not the giant one. At last, I gave up looking for him and began to gather abalones for winter. The red shells hold the sweetest meat and are best for drying, though the green ones and the black ones are also good. Because the red ones are the sweetest, starfish prey upon them. This starship creature places itself over the shell of an abalone. With its five arms spread out against the rock to which the abalone is fastened, it holds the shell with its suckers and then begins to lift itself. The starfish pulls against the abalone shell, sometimes for days, holding on with its suckers and pushing up with its legs until little by little the heavy shell comes loose from the body. One morning we left the cave and paddled out to the reef, which is joined to it. For many days I had been gathering a few shellfish on the rocks of Coral Cove, but I had been watching the reef and waiting for the right time to harvest. This is when there are few starfish feeding, for they are as hard to pry loose from an abalone as an abalone is to pry from a rock. The tide was low and the reef rose far out of the water. Along its sides were great numbers of red abalones and very few starfish. So before the sun was high, I filled the bottom of the canoe. The day was windless, and since I had all I could carry, I tied the canoe and with Rontu following me, climbed onto the reef to look for fish to spear for our supper. Blue dolphins were leaping beyond the kelp beds. In the kelp, otter were playing at the games they never tire of. And around me everywhere, the gulls were fishing for scallops, which were numerous that summer. They grow on the floating kelp leaves, and there were so many of them that much of the kelp near the reef had been dragged to the bottom. Still, there were scallops that the gulls could reach, and taking them in their beaks, they would fly far above the reef and let them drop. The gulls would then swoop down to the rocks and pick the meat from the broken shells. Scallops fell on the reef like rain, which amused me, but not Rontu, who could not understand what the gulls were doing. Dodging this way and that, I went to the end of the reef where the biggest fish lived. With a sinew line and a hook made of abalone shell, I caught two that had large heads and long teeth, but are good to eat. I gave one to Rontu, and then on the way back to the canoe gathered purple sea urchins to use for dying. Rontu, who was trotting along in front of me, suddenly dropped his fish and stood looking down over the edge of the reef. There, swimming in the clear water was a devilfish. It was the same one I had been hunting for. It was the giant. Seldom did you see any devilfish here, for they like deep places. And the water along this part of the reef is shallow. Perhaps this one lived in the cave and came here only when he could not find food. Rantu made no sound. I fixed the head of the spear and the long string that held it to my wrist. I then crawled back to the edge of the reef. The giant had not moved. He was just floating below the surface of the water and I could plainly see his eyes. They were the size of small stones and stood out from his head with black rims and gold centers. And in the center, a black spot, like the eyes of a spirit I had once seen on a night that rain fell and lightning forked in the sky. Where my hands rested was a deep crevice and in it, a fish was hiding. The giant was half the length of my sphere from the reef, but while I watched, one of his long arms ran out like a snake and felt its way into the crevice. It went past the fish and along the side of the rock, and then the end of it curled back. As the arms gently wound itself around the fish from behind, I rose to one knee and drove the spear. I aimed at the giant's head, but though it was larger than my two fishes and a good target, I missed. The spear struck down through the water and slanted off. Instantly, a black cloud surrounded the devil fish. The only thing I could see of him was one long arm still grasping his prey. I jumped to my feet to pull in the spear, thinking that I might have a chance to throw it again. As I did so, the shaft bobbed back to the surface and I saw that the barbed point had come loose. At the same moment, the string tightened. My grip on it broke and aware that I had struck the devil fish, I quickly dropped the coils I held. And when the string runs out fast, it burns your hands or becomes entangled. The devil fish does not swim with fins or flippers like other things in the sea. He takes water in through the hole in the front of his body and pushes the water out behind through, behind through two slits. 
When he is swimming slowly, you can see these two streams trailing out, but only then. When he moves fast, you can see nothing except a streak in the water. The coils I had dropped on the rock hopped and sang as they ran. Then there were no more of them. The string tightened on my wrist, and to lessen the shock, I leapt across the crevice in the direction the giant had taken. With the string in both hands, but still fastened on my wrist, I braced my feet on the slippery rock and leaned backwards. The string snapped tight with the weight of the devil fish. It began to stretch, and fearing that it might break, I walked forward, yet I made him pull me every step. He was moving toward the cave along the edge of the reef. The cave was a good distance away. If he got there, I would surely lose him. The canoe was tied just in front of me. Once I was in it, I could let him pull me until he grew tired but there was no way to untie the canoe and still hold on to my string. Rontu, all this time, was running up and down the reef, barking and leaping at me, which made my task harder. Step by step, I walked forward until the devilfish was in the deep water close to the cave. He was so close that I had to stop, even if the sinew broke and I lost him. I therefore braced myself and did not move. The sinew stretched, throwing off drops of water I could hear it stretch and I was sure it would break. I did not feel it cutting into my hands, though they bled. The pull suddenly lessened and I was sure that he was gone. But the next instant, I saw the string cutting the water in a wide circle. He was swimming off from the cave in the reef towards some rocks that were about twice the length of the string away. He would be safe there too, for among them were many places to hide. I pulled in half the string while he was moving toward the rocks, but soon had to let it go. It grew tight and began again to stretch. The water here was only a little over my waist and I'd let myself down over the reef. There was a sandbar not far from the rocks and stepping carefully on the bottom, which was full of holes, I slowly made my way toward it. Rontu swam along by my side. I reached the sandbar before the devilfish could hide himself in the rocks. The string held and he turned about and once more swam toward the cave. Twice again he did this. Each time, I took in some of the string. The third time, as he came up into the shallow water, I walked backwards along across the sandbar so he could not see me and pulled on the string with all my strength. The giant slid up on the sand. He lay with his arms spread out partly in the water and I thought he was dead. Then I saw his eyes moving. Before I could shout a warning, Rontu had rushed forward and seized him. But the devilfish was too heavy to lift or shake. As Rontu's jaws sought another hold, three of the many arms wound themselves around his neck. Devilfish are only dangerous when in the water where they can fasten themselves to you with their long arms. These arms have rows of suckers underneath them and they can drag you under the hold and hold you there until you drown. But even on land, the devilfish can injure you for he is strong and does not die quickly. The giant was flailing his arms, struggling to get back into the water. Little by little, he was dragging Rontu with him. I could no longer use the string because it was wound around Rontu's legs. The whalebone knife I had used for prying abalones from the rocks was tied to a thong at my waist. The blade was thick at the point, but had a sharp edge. I dropped the coils of string and unfastened the knife as I ran. I ran past the devilfish and got between him and the deep water. So many of his arms were flailing that it was useless to cut any one of them. One struck me on the leg and burned like a whip. Another, which Rontu had chewed off, lay wriggling at the edge of the water as if it were looking for something to fasten onto. The head rose out of the twisting arms like a giant stalk. The gold eyes with their black rims were fixed on me. Above the sounds of the waves and the water splashing and Rontu's barking, I could hear the snapping of his beak which was sharper than the knife I held in my hand. I drove the knife down into his body, and as I did this, I was suddenly covered, or so it seemed, with a countless number of leeches sucking at my skin. Fortunately, one hand was free, the hand that held the knife, and again and again I struck down through the tough hide. The suckers, which were fastened to me and pained greatly, lessened their hold. Slowly, the arms stopped moving and then grew limp. I tried to drag the devilfish out of the water, but my strength was gone. I did not even go back to the reef for my canoe. 
though I did take the shaft and the head of the spear, which had cost me much labor and the sinew line. It was night before Rantu and I got back to the house. Rantu had a gash on his nose from the giant's beak and I had many cuts and bruises. I saw two more giant devilfish along the reef that summer, but I did not try to spear them. <laughs>